Dr. Lauren Lownan, and um, this is going to be the first part of a lecture on genome assembly. I'm going to talk a little bit about theory and a little bit about the history of um, the graph theory that lies underneath modern genome assemblers. So we're going to talk about genome assembly. We'll use terms like overlap graph and think about when um, and in what context those were used in genome assembly. We're going to talk about Hamiltonian and Eulerian paths. Eulerian is how you pronounce, um, you know, this word over here. Um, we're going to talk about three famous mathematicians from long ago. Well, some long ago, some more recently. And what they did that was really important for um, genome assembly, even though they didn't know that that's what they were doing it for. We're going to talk about what are called De Bruyne graphs. Uh, talk about kamers and what they have to do with assembly. And then we're going to talk about who first thought of applying De Bruyne graphing to genome assembly. So an assembler is a computer program that does assembly. So remember that during DNA sequencing, um, the DNA is chopped up into really small pieces that we refer to as reads. The small pieces are sequenced, or the reads are the sequence, and then they are stored in fastq.gz files. That .gz means zipped, and the fastq means a FASTA file with associated quality information. An assembler takes the information that the sequencer provides, usually you do some trimming, some processing beforehand, some filtering out of low quality reads, then you take that cleaned up data, which is still in little tiny fragments, and you feed it into the assembler program. Um, and it's going to take those small sequences and reassemble them into larger fragments that hopefully resemble um, as closely as possible the original sequence um, from which all of this is derived. And we're going to talk about a program, actually we're going to use a program called SPADES, um, St. Petersburg Assembler. So genome assembly means, and this definition is taken from Wikipedia, so you can take a look at it there if you want. It's a term that is used in bioinformatics. It's a type of sequence assembly which refers to aligning and merging fragments from a, that are derived from a longer DNA sequence in order to reconstruct the original sequence. And in the context of genome assembly, that means um, whole genomes. Assembly, there are um, two fundamental approaches, and one is called mapping or read based assembly, sorry, mapping or reference assembly, and the other is called de novo assembly. So, mapping assembly means that you take your sequence reads and um, or contigs, okay, or even larger units, and you assemble them into larger fragments or larger pieces by mapping those reads against a reference sequence of a genome. So in order to do mapping assembly, you need to have quite a bit of information about the organism from which your data is derived. So in, in my lab, we would need to know that it is data from the bacterium Vibrio vulnificus, and we would need to have a high quality finished reference genome from Vibrio vulnificus and then we would take our new raw reads from some new strain or isolate of that organism, and we would map them against that reference assembly. And that is a great approach for certain kinds of questions, um, but there are also some problems with it. Um, maybe more common, at least in microbiology today, is to do something called de novo assembly. So de novo means from new or new, you know, from new and newly original assembly. And when you're doing de novo assembly, what you do is you assemble your reads without using any kind of template or reference sequence slash genome. So it's kind of done from scratch, just using the internal information. And that's what you'll be learning how to do in class, primarily. So, but for a moment, back to mapping assembly or reference assembly. Here in the top, this blue line running across the top, you know, that is some known reference genome or sequence. Say that is a known Vibrio vulnificus. It's been very well sequenced um, with a lot of different tech and it has been assembled so that, you know, we have, in the case of 
This creature has two chromosomes, so we have two intact chromosomes. Maybe this is chromosome one. And then here is your raw read data. This is looking like paired end data to me, um, like you would get from an aluminum machine. And you take, you, this is the, from your isolate, and this is from the known. And you map these reads against the known. You can get really good quality assemblies this way. We're going to use de novo assembly, however, um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that de novo assembly is better for unknown or less characterized organisms and proteins. So in the case of the Vibrio vulnificus project that I'm involved in in my lab, um, we've got novel isolates and we know that they are Vibrio vulnificus, but we also know that within that species there's an incredible amount of diversity and um, so we don't want to force the assembly into what is already known. So we might want to see if we've got new genetic configurations in the isolates that we're studying. For example, maybe there's been some horizontal gene transfer bringing some new genes in, or maybe there's been some shuffling of the genome through inversions or rearrangements or other genomic phenomena. And we don't want to miss seeing any of that. So we're going to assemble our data de novo. Um, the disadvantages to de novo assembly, there are a couple of them. One, it is more computationally demanding. So the algorithms are, I believe, inherently more challenging um, and require more computer resources. Um, it's also not quite as good when you're looking for tiny differences in well-known genomes. So for example, if you're comparing one human to another, um, Reference-based assembly is, is most likely going to be the assembly of choice for, for that. So de novo genome assembly can look like this. Here's your chromosome, like that's where the sequence was originally derived from, and that's what you're trying to get back to. Here are the reads, right, the raw reads, say from your Illumina sequencer, these could be paired end reads. You're going to take those reads and you're going to algorithmically, computationally, put them together into longer contiguous sequences, referred to as contigs. Then you can also computationally connect these together into even longer fragments with some programs. And those fragments are called scaffolds. And if you have enough of these and enough information from that, you might be able to get all the way back to the intact chromosome. So scaffold is a new word that I'm using here. You haven't been introduced to that before. A scaffold is a sequence that is made of contigs and known gaps. It is linked together computationally. And to be honest, we won't really use that phrase much in our um, classroom setting, we're mostly just going to focus on getting contigs. Going from contigs to scaffolds, though, in case you're curious, it could be done like this. You might take data from what are short insert paired end reads, like what we're getting from the Illumina sequencer at the Hubbard Genome Center at UNH. We have 250 base pair fragments, relatively short, and you might compare that with older data where you had longer inserts, right? Or perhaps Sanger data, although I'll get to that in the next slide. And when we combine these different pieces of information, algorithmically, we can regenerate um, an assembly of longer fragments referred to as scaffolds. You could also combine short and long read technology, as I alluded to a moment ago. You could take your short Illumina reads, and you could take much longer, this is not drawn to scale, reads from, say, the Oxford Nanopore um, Minion or more standard systems, and you could combine those two pieces of information, and in so doing, you could get much longer um, structures, scaffolds, or perhaps even whole genomes. So with that, I'm going to stop this part of the lecture and then carry on with part two.